We are a nation of immigrants, but we are also a nation of laws. You, sir, have betray betrayed constitutional order, neglected your duty, and violated the trust of the American people. And as a nation of laws, I look forward to your impeachment. That I yield back. It, we can sit here and talk, and, and for four hours now, three hours, however long this has gone on, there's a lot of apologies, but not a lot of answers. And we need answers for the American people, and I think you're to be held responsible for that. And, and, and believe me, it, it's not fun to have parents in here te te telling us how they lost their child to fentanyl poisoning, but it's on your watch, sir. For prompt it's removal. Thank you. Do you oppose state policies that forbid local authorities from cooperation, cooperating with ICE? Um, I am aware of some that I do oppose. So you oppose California's sanctuary state law? I am not familiar with the particulars of that law. Have you encountered California's restrictions on uh, cooperation with local law, with uh, federal immigration authorities? Congressman, I believe it is imperative that we cooperate with one another. Jurisdictions cooperate with us when it serves the public safety need. Thank you. Other than President Donald J. Trump, the greatest president in my lifetime, with the most safest and secure border, I believe President Clinton understood just how important border security is to our nation. But boy, oh boy, have times changed. 28 years later, the left has gone off the rails. They've gone completely nuts. They've done just the opposite of what the leader of the Democrat Party, President Clinton, stood for on border security in 1995. This committee's ranking member, he was in Congress in 1995. I assume he stood. I may assume he stood. It seemed like the majority, if not all, of the entire chamber, they stood. Matter of fact, Mr. Clinton delivered his speech in the third year of his first term. And he was reelected in 1996. He beat Bob Dole, won by over 8 million votes, won the Electoral College 379 to 159. He had the support of the American people, and I'm going to assume the ranking member also voted for Bill Clinton in 1996. We have two other members, uh, Ms. Jackson and Ms. Lofgren. They were both freshmen at the time. I will assume they stood during that powerful speech as well. And do you know why they supported and voted? They voted for legislation in 1996 strengthening our immigration laws. I applaud them for that. So what's changed, folks? What's changed with the Democrat Party? I'll tell you what's changed. If you wouldn't have heard President Clinton's voice or seen his face, you would have thought Donald Trump delivered that speech. I don't believe that President Clinton was called a racist, a white supremacist who hated immigrants as the left and the dishonest media has painted Donald J. Trump to be. Mr. Mayorkas, there's a reason why you and Joe Biden have allowed 5.5 million people to cross our southern border. This is about votes and elections. I have a report from the Heritage Foundation titled Tracking Movement of Illegal Aliens from NGOs to Interior of the USA. Why do you think NGOs have moved illegal immigrants to 431 of the 435 congressional districts? The truth is, hear me, it's because the Democrats' progressive policies are not acceptable to Americans. Heritage obtained a sampling of approximately 30,000 cell phones that were tracked to NGOs along border states. They tracked approximately 22,000 devices at 20 NGO locations in January 2022. The same devices were later traced to 431 separate U.S. congressional districts, and of the 52 with the highest rate of tracked devices, 71 of them were Republican congressional districts. The report revealed that it's not a coincidence, folks. The flood of illegal immigrants means a continued rise in supply, surplus laborers. That surplus drives down the wages of existing middle class and lower class job holders until they leave the job forces and then they're forced to go on welfare with the hopes that they will become loyal supporters of the Democrats. That's what this is all about. If this isn't about votes, if this isn't about votes, one party rule, keeping the Democrats in power, I make this suggestion. If you put the American people first, you should refer back to Trump's border policies, but you won't because you hate him. You despise the man. So give Bill Clinton a call, and then he can help you with the border crisis. As President Clinton stated, we are a nation of immigrants, but we are also a nation of laws. You, sir, have betray betrayed constitutional order, neglected your duty, and violated the trust of the American people. And as a nation of laws, I look forward to your impeachment. That I yield back. Here today, I, I'm certainly appalled at what's happening at the southern border. And I know my constituents are, too. Um, your border policies make every state a border state. And uh, 
I, I said my constituents are appalled, but what's happening? But I know a family who has personally been suffering the consequences of, of your actions. And uh, in my district, the second congressional districts in Alabama, the Tulsa County Sheriff's Department arrested Grevy Zavala, a 29-year-old illegal alien from Honduras, for the rape of a teenage girl in Prattville, Alabama, in a restaurant. The interesting thing is Mr. Zavala identified, I guess, as a minor is what I'm being told, but he was a 29-year-old. And uh, Mr. Secretary, why do you think it is, and I've been to the border a few times myself, that we're finding so many IDs thrown down south of the border. Just, it, it's almost like if these people were coming here for, to apply for asylum, they'd want us to know who they were and what they were up to. But for some reason, ID after ID are just piling up south of the U.S. border. Why do you think that might be? Um, Congressman, uh, first of all, I'm very sorry, of course, to learn of the tragedy uh, that uh, occurred that was inflicted on a constituent uh, of yours. I understand that, Mr. Mayor. And let me say this, sir. Um, we've been apologizing to a lot of people for a long time, at least in the last few months, last few years. Even when the other party was in charge, they had the White House, the House, and the Senate. And we're continuing apologizing to parents for losing their children to fentanyl and for people getting raped in restrooms, and for DUIs or people who are killing people with cars who have no driver's license. And I understand the apologies, but my people, the constituents in this country, are getting tired of apologies, and they want action. And so who's responsible for the death, or let's say the rape of this 14-year-old? Is that you, Mr. Mayorkas, or is that President Biden, or is it Congress? Who's responsible for that? Congressman, uh, the criminal who committed the act is responsible I look forward to working with you to address the scourge of fentanyl that is causing so much devastation and death. I look forward to working with you to fix what has long been a broken immigration system. I hear you, but let me say this, sir, and, and you're aware of this too. This administration has created two things on the southern border, drug mules and human trafficking. And it's the policies of this administration, because we talked about it earlier in here, and you said four to $5,000. Yeah, that's just south of the U.S. southern border. In Yuma, Arizona, there's 109 different countries came through that small town. And further south of the border, they're paying the cartel seven or $8,000. Syrians are paying $19,000. So the cartel's getting rich, and the American people are paying the price in the form of crimes and drug deaths. And so it, we can sit here and talk, and, and for four hours now, three hours, however long this has gone on, there's a lot of apologies, but not a lot of answers. And we need answers for the American people, and I think you're to be held responsible for that. And, and, and believe me, it, it's not fun to have parents in here telling us how they lost their child to fentanyl poisoning, but it's on your watch, sir, sir, and it's on our watch. And we have a responsibility to do something about that. And so, you know, it, it just, again, the policies, we're turning a blind eye, and people are pouring in here. Sheriff Daniel said himself in testimony a few months ago, he said, the safest he's ever seen the U.S. southern border. He was a four, dec four decades on the U.S. southern border. It was around 2018. He said the worst he's ever seen is now. And so we have a responsibility to these people. Let me ask you another question. This is an individual. I just got this information. Um, reports in November of 2021, DHS encountered Issam Basi, an alien on the terror watch list. Now, Mr. Basi, despite quote from the FBI, Highly derogatory information, end quote. This is in the FBI's database. DHS decided to release him into the U.S. because he was overweight and may have been uh, susceptible to COVID-19. Are overweight terrorists not a threat to the U.S.? I'm sorry, Congressman. Are overweight terrorists? We turned Mr. Bozzi loose because he was overweight and afraid he might get COVID, and he was on the FBI's list, so... Are they a threat, overweight terrorists? Congressman, uh, individuals who pose a threat to national security or public safety are detained. That is the policy. Uh, Unless they're of the overweight. Department of Homeland security. That is false. Well, that's what the report is. I'm not familiar with that report. I look forward to reading it. Congressman, the weight of an individual is not relevant to their profile as a threat to the United States. It is to, to catching American. COVID, though, apparently. <laughs> Congressman, allow me to repeat myself. Individuals who pose a public safety threat or a national security threat are priorities for detention. That is the policy of the Department of Homeland Security. Who's to blame for the, the floodgates being opened on the southern border, Mr. Mayorkas? Co Congress, Congressman, uh, I look forward to working with you to fix what is clearly a broken immigration system. The issue of migration, the increase in migration, is not exclusive to the United States. During World War II, there were 60 million displaced people around the world. 
Now there are over 170. We just had a report earlier today. Somebody said that there is no border in the, anywhere on the globe that is more porous, if you will, than the United States border and more insecure. And it's on your watch, sir. And with that, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, last year you testified before this committee that this administration's policies uh, were not responsible for the surge of illegal border crossings. Uh, and today you've testified that this administration's policies are responsible uh, for what you claim uh, is a decline in illegal border crossings. Uh, so why is it that you deserve credit when numbers go down but not blame when numbers go up? Congressman, uh, two points. One, uh, the approach that we are taking expanding lawful pathways and delivering consequences for those who do not use them um, is working. But I want to communicate that the challenge remains. The challenge is a persistent one on our southern border. It has been for decades. And what we need okay. is Mr. Secretary, you're speaking in general terms. And I think this is why uh, many of us on the committee are frustrated with the lack of accountability, is that you have shattered all records in terms of illegal border crossings. You say that has nothing to do uh, with the dramatic change in policies you had. And then there's a brief decline, and you cite that as evidence that you're doing a good job. And I think that's why so many Americans have lost faith in this administration's ability to secure the border. But I want to actually um, reference uh, some remarks you made that I found uh, somewhat encouraging. This was on the topic of detainers. You made these remarks early in your tenure, your April of 2021, at a UCLA uh, discussion for, uh, with the Immigration Law uh, and Policy Center. Um, you said this. You said uh, you referred to uh, an example of someone who crossed the border illegally and went on to commit sex offenses. And you said, I do not believe that individual should be released into the community. You said, I think the state, the state facility, should turn that individual over to ICE directly. And you added, I think that is a public safety need. You went on to say that after such a person had served their sentence, if they were a citizen, they might, there might be no way uh, to keep them out of the community. But you said, I have a tool at my disposal with respect to an individual who unlawfully entered the country. You said, I feel strongly about this. Is it a tool that I have at my disposal? It is a tool I feel obligated to employ. I am going to protect the public, you said. It's a very strong statement in favor of detainers. And yet, over the last uh, couple years, we have seen the actual use of detainers uh, decline dramatically. Fiscal year 2021, there were 65,000. Fiscal year 2022, 78,000. That's about half the average during the Trump administration, about one-third the average during the Obama administration. So if detainers are such a powerful tool, why have you used them so sparingly? Uh, Congressman, uh, let, me, let me communicate a very important point, that individuals who pose a threat to public safety or national security are detained. That is the immigration policy of the Department of Homeland Security under my leadership. But why are you detaining Indivi much less than your predecessor? Ms. Individuals, indivi well, one is our detention capacity is limited, which is why we prioritize public safety and national security threats, number one. And number two, uh, detainers are sometimes not honored by particular jurisdictions. I want to move on to that in a second, but just briefly, uh, has the White House directed you to limit the use of detainers? Congressman, um, uh, that's a yes or no question. Has the White House? Uh, Congressman, no they, no, they have not. Okay, thank you. So on this topic of uh, jurisdictions not honoring detainers, you have been critical of these so-called sanctuary uh, jurisdictions. In a uh, 2022 speech to the U.S. Conference of Mayors, uh, you said some of your cities have declined to cooperate with immigration authorities in the removal of the apprehension and removal of individuals, even if those individuals pose a public safety threat. You said, I will be coming to you and asking you to reconsider your position of non-cooperation. The public safety, the public's well-being for which we are all charged is, I think, at issue, you said. So, Mr. Secretary, you agree that sanctuary policies threaten public safety. Congressman, uh, what do you mean by sanctuary policies? Because the definition that you gave right there, where you said the... Uh, declining to cooperate with immigration authorities and the removal, the apprehension or removal, removal of individuals, even if those individuals pose a public safety threat. Is that, are those sanctuary policies as you define them a threat to public safety? So sanctuary policies are defined differently by different communities. But to your definition. If I, if I may. Is it a threat to public safety? I do not consider it in the service of public safety to release an individual into the community 
when that individual can be released to Immigration and Customs Enforcement for prompt removal. Thank you. Do you oppose state policies that forbid local authorities from cooperation, cooperating with ICE? Um, I am aware of some that I do oppose. So you oppose California's sanctuary state law? I am not familiar with the particulars of that law. Have you encountered California's restrictions on uh, cooperation with local with uh, federal immigration authorities? Congressman, I believe it is imperative that we cooperate with one another. Jurisdictions cooperate with us when it serves the public safety need. Thank you. I'm out of time, but I would like to restate for the record that you, the policies you said uh, that you oppose overriding the ability of local jurisdictions to cooperate, that's exactly what California's sanctuary state law does. Thank you, and I yield back. Chair, recognize the gentleman in Colorado, Mr. Nagus. Uh, I thank the chairman. Mr. Secretary.